Welcome to Love from the Hip. I'm spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and your host, Sakura Sutter. This show is created with the intention of helping others to help and love themselves. Aside from weekly skin tips, you will hear me feature amazing souls from around the world who are making a difference by helping others in their own unique way. You may also hear me follow up with a guest I have hypnotized on an online edition of Love from the Hip, which is available on YouTube. Together, we can all make a difference, and it starts with love. Love from the Hip. There are currently about 2,500 war and military dogs in service today in the U.S., with about 700 serving at any given time overseas. MWDs, or military war dogs, have fought alongside American forces in every conflict since the Revolutionary War, but only officially since World War II. The practice of using dogs in battle goes back as early as mid-7th century B.C. Greece in the war waged by the Ephesians, where every horseman was accompanied by a dog. Other ancient civilizations that used dogs included the Egyptians, Persians, Romans, and Slavs, to name a few. Later, it was the Spanish, Russians, Dutch, French, Germans, and others who used dogs during wartime. Some of the breeds of dogs that were used were Indian hounds, mastiffs, labradors, Doberman pinchers, and Belgian Malinois. The dogs had different duties during war, which included fighting, serving as a mascot, delivering messages, pulling carts, searching and rescuing wounded men, tracking and detecting bombs and mines, scouting out snipers and booby traps, sensing ambushes, guarding base camps, as well as during World War II, they were used sadly for animal testing. Modern day military dogs are outfitted with cameras and microphones to relay audio and video to their handlers. They are used for sniffing out drugs and explosives, as well as for intimidating prisoners. They also jump out of airplanes and other military aircraft alongside their fellow soldier. Traditionally, as in World War II, U.S. military war dogs were returned home after the war to their former owners or new adopted ones. After the Vietnam War, however, U.S. war dogs were deemed expendable and were either euthanized or turned over to an allied army prior to U.S. departure. Vietnam is the only war in which the U.S. war dogs sadly never came home. In 2000, however, Bill Clinton signed Robbie's Law, which allowed these dogs to be adopted after their service in the military so that they would no longer be euthanized. Approximately 5,000 dogs served in Vietnam, and according to the United States War Dog Association, war dogs saved over 10,000 lives in Vietnam. Military dogs generally spend eight to nine years in service. They are typically purchased from Germany and the Netherlands and are trained by what is called a puppy development specialist. They work with the puppies until six to seven months when they begin their training. They essentially help them prepare, the, th- prepare them for the jobs they will have. Only 50% of dogs make it through the training, and most dogs are said to be selected for their love of a ball or the Kong. It becomes part of their training in simulating a hidden bomb and it becomes their so-called paycheck for their years of service. After their training, MWDs are paired with one person who is called their handler. They build an unspeakable bond with their handler and will mourn the loss of them if it should occur. 90% of retired military dogs are adopted by their handlers, and retired military dogs, much like retired veterans, will seek out employment in law enforcement after their service. Military dogs, especially those that can detect bombs, also have a high monetary value. Those that have a 98% accuracy are said to be worth over $150,000. And like soldiers, military war dogs are awarded medals and honored for their acts of heroism. And unfortunately, like soldiers, they also can suffer from PTSD. In fact, about a year ago, the U.S. military officially recognized canine PTSD, or CPTSD. It is no wonder dogs experience PTSD, as mice and rats in lab studies have shown to exhibit PTSD as well. Symptoms of canine PTSD include hypervigilance, increased startle response, attempts to run away or escape, withdrawal, changes in rapport with their handler, and problems performing tasks. A lot of these canine PTSD symptoms resemble those of combat PTSD symptoms in soldiers. And like soldiers, some dogs can shrug off the trauma while, while others are severely affected. About 5 to 10 percent have shown signs of CPTSD. And according to researchers, like soldiers, they are genetically programmed to respond that way. Numerous genes and epigenetic influences have been suggested to have underlying susceptibility to PTSD. They somehow influence the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight-or-flight response. There is also evidence that early traumatic life experiences 
can set children and dogs up for PTSD through an environment gene reaction. Regardless of the cause or the chemical reaction that occurs for PTSD to, to develop, clinical studies have found that certain selective serotonin blockers help dogs with PTSD. War dogs are a great model for study of PTSD in people. After all, they not only experience the traumas of war like a soldier, they also experience the brotherhood, the unspoken communication, the fearless desire to fight, and the ability to be hyper-aware and in the present moment. They experience war as a soldier, except on four legs. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Ryan Matthews. He is an Army veteran who was a military war dog handler, TEDx speaker, author, and dog trainer. He will share his incredible journey, his work with elite Army canines, how he has dealt with his own PTSD, as well as how to overcome PTSD through dog training. So stick around after this quick break. Hypnotherapy helps you discover and explore deep, sustainable life changes. Let Sakura guide your communication with your unconscious mind. Rid yourself of negative behaviors, fears, pains, and emotions. Weight loss, smoking, childhood drama, chronic pain, and much more can be addressed. Begin healing now. Just $100 for the first session. Learn more. Sakura Skin and Mind.com. S A K U R A Skin and Mind. Dot com. Bring out the healthy way of thinking you didn't know you had. Alternative Talk 1150. Talk radio for the body, mind, and soul. Welcome back to Love from the Hip. I'm spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and your host, Sakura Sutter. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Facebook and to subscribe and share my YouTube channel and podcast on Podcast One, Love from the Hip, and that's HYP. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Ryan Matthews. He is an Army veteran and former military war dog handler who worked with elite Army canines, a TEDx speaker, author, and dog trainer. Hey, Ryan, thanks for being here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. And where are you joining us from? I'm in Huntington Beach, Southern Uh, California. Nice. (laughs) So how long did you work with military war dogs for? I got certified at Lackland Air Force Base in 2002, so I'm kind of dating myself. Uh, I was 10 at the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 2002, uh, until my discharge in the Army, which was in 2006. So I worked for with Army military working dogs uh, for four years. Okay. Uh, and then I got out, and I worked as a civilian contractor where I worked a narcotic dog uh, in the Marshall Islands in Micronesia. Oh, wow. Okay. So what was your experience like working with these dogs? Wow. It was incredible. And I didn't realize just how much of a bond you could have with a dog because I never had dogs growing up. I always had a love for animals. Um, But dogs really, the military working dogs, gave me this opportunity to really bond and connect like no other. Mm-hmm. And I truthfully had walls up as it related to my connections with people because of trauma as a kid. Mm-hmm. And so dogs really allowed me to open up my heart. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll never forget my first military working dog, Raleigh, who I bonded with the most. And what kind of dog was he? Raleigh was a German Shepherd narcotic detection dog. And he was actually six years old when I got him. Mm-hmm. And he and I were stationed in Seoul, Korea. And he was my first dog, so my first my first working dog love, and <laughs> I, he broke my heart. Aww. When I had to leave Korea, uh, Raleigh didn't get to stay. Raleigh had to stay, and I didn't get to stay. I had to move on to a new duty station. And that's one thing that I think is wrong. Uh, I feel like dog teams should really transfer together mm-hmm. rather than the dogs stay and then the handler move on does that have to do with the job that they're trained in as to why that they is, have to stay? that's a really good point and that's a piece of it but truthfully it really comes down to line items unfortunately and okay. i as a soldier was a line item and so are military working dogs yeah. and it has to do with us being equipment and i know that sounds bad right. but we are assigned to a particular command Okay. And the dog doesn't change command. And okay. so that dog is, is property of that certain command or that unit. And that's why 
the dogs unfortunately stay at the same place and the handlers rotate in and out. Yeah, well, and that's going to be difficult because I'm sure that you're building this unspoken communication, right? Like he's picking up on your mannerisms and even your lack of communication, <laughs> right? You got that right. It's like you know me. <laughs> it's it, honestly an art. When we see a military working dog do detection, meaning they're sniffing for drugs or explosives, yeah, it's a true art is how I see yeah. it. It's a beautiful dance to see a dog work odor. And I think it's just really incredible to see. And you're right. It takes time to build that connection and that bond and that, that art together of the handler knowing how to read the dog and the dog knowing how to read the handler. And because it takes time to form, again, it's kind of unfortunate that we do yeah. move on and have to recreate that elsewhere. Yeah, and I bet there's a little bit of trauma, too, for the dog when they have to get a new handler, right, to dismiss their old handler. like That's that. a really good point. And years ago, when I had just trained military working dogs, I would have said absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. But that would have been my projection, to be transparent with you. Okay. What I've learned in training thousands of pet dogs is dogs are extremely resilient. And mm. surprisingly, if a new handler or new owner will treat that dog really well and have a great life with them, dogs will actually be like, hey, you're my new awesome human. Right. Okay. And I know that's not what people want to hear, but <laughs> yeah. dog, dogs are, yes, they're loyal, uh -huh. uh, but they're also loyal to who will be really good to them. Okay. And who will feed them. <laughs> that's right. That's all part of it. So how did you get involved with military war dogs? Right. I was very fortunate when I was stationed at my very first duty station in Germany, I was selected to drive for the colonel. I was in charge of all the military police in Europe. And he asked me, what did I want to do after my tour was done working for him? And I said, sir, I want to be a dog handler. And he didn't like dog handling at the time something else like protect the generals but i saw these canine handlers on a deployment to croatia and when i saw those guys i was like that was ex that's exactly what i want to do that looks so <laughs> awesome those guys are super chill it seems like a good life yeah. and once i saw that i knew that was exactly what i wanted to do and so i asked for the colonel again i really want to go canine and eventually he helped put me in for it and the rest the rest is history <laughs> well, awesome. Well, I hate to interrupt you, Ryan, but we're going to have to take a quick break. So everyone stick around for more Love from the Hip. Post-traumatic stress syndrome affects people from all walks of life, triggered by sexual assault, traffic, collisions, warfare, or other threats to life. PTSD is a killer. Every day, an average of 22 veterans commit suicide due in part to PTSD. Retired U.S. Colonel Debbie Simpson struggled with her own PTSD, following a military career specializing in critical care. Debbie turned to dancing as a way to heal unresolved grief, guilt, and shame caused by the losses of war. The benefits were so great that she founded the nonprofit Battlefield to Ballroom, a unique approach to assisting other brave warriors. Battlefield to Ballroom has partnered with famed dance company Arthur Murray International to help veterans in need. If you or someone you know can benefit, log on now to battlefieldtoballroom.org. That's Battlefield, the number two, ballroom.org. Life is a dance, and you can give the gift of the first steps towards recovery. Donate at battlefieldtoballroom.org today. Men, care for your skin properly, starting with your face. Sakura Skin and Mind offers their Gentleman's Groom Clinical Facial for just $120. Designed for your rugged skin, a deep cleansing clinical facial is like a one, two, three punch to wrinkles, age spots, and problem skin. Tame those brows, ears, and nostrils. Sakura Skin and Mind, erasing wrinkles one clinical facial at a time. Learn more at sakuraskinandmind.com. S-A-K-U-R-A SkinAndMind.com at Madsen Medical Spa, our goal is a healthy, beautiful you. We're a full-service medical spa, but our focus is educating people on maintaining health and wellness. We're excited to announce a new addition to our menu, Nootropic Popular Beverage. This magical drink formulation alleviates unnecessary snacking while keeping you focused and alert throughout your day. It satisfies your hunger, renews your energy, enhances your mood, diminishes aches and pains. Essentially, it makes you happy. 
And who doesn't want to be happy? Patients have already been raving about Nootropic popular beverage. They've elevated their mood while losing inches in the process. It's safe, natural, fast, and effective. Drink happy, feel happy. Nootropic popular beverage, happiness in a cup. Available at happytoelevate.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-T-O-E-L-E-V-A-T-E.com. Or call 206-234-9188. Warning, you may feel happy. Is your tween starting to experience a change in their skin? Want to get them on an easy at-home routine and have good skin hygiene? Allow Sakura Skin in Mind to help your tween out. This brief, deep cleansing and educational 35-minute facial is just enough to get your tween, ages 10 to 12 years old, started off in the right direction. Sakura Skin in Mind uses the latest in the clinical skincare industry to care for your tween the right way for just $65. Sakura Skin in Mind, treating skin out there with an of treatment and a pound of protection. Call 206-730-7429 or go to sakuraskinandmind.com. Be sure to support the sponsors of your favorite shows on Alternative Talk 1150. Welcome back to Love from the Hip. I'm spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and your host, Sakura Sutter. Don't forget to tune in right here on KKNW every Wednesday at 2 to 3 p.m. for more Love from the Hip. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Ryan Matthews. He is an Army veteran and former military war dog handler who worked with elite Army canines, TEDx speaker, author, and dog trainer. So before the break, you were telling us how you got involved with military war dogs, but why did you join the Army? Oh, geez. I don't know if you're all are ready for that story. <laughs> oh, we're <Yeah>. ready. <laughs> okay, good. Well, it's definitely not because I was patriotic. It was because I was a drug dealer. Okay. And my friend tried to rob me of my own drugs. And my brother taught me in the drug game, you never trust anybody. And so I was ready for whatever would happen anytime I had drugs on me or was doing a deal. And so I had a knife in my shoe. And when my friend tried to rob me, obviously, I didn't know that was going to happen. But again, I'm always ready for anything. I tried to stab him. Mm. Now... <laughs> I did not know what I was doing. So when I tried to, I can laugh at it now. It wasn't funny at the time. Right. When I tried to stab him, the knife slips and I nearly cut my finger off. Ugh. So I didn't stab him. I pretty much stabbed, stabbed myself. Yourself. Yeah. And he threatened to blow my head off with a shotgun. And a few days later, he called my work mm. and I ran away. Mm -hmm. I had, why I joined the army. I went to the army and I said, give me two things. Give me a military police because I want to clean my act up mm. and give me station really far away. I wanted to run and hide. <laughs> <laughs> so where did they put you? They stationed me in Germany. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that was far away enough. Yeah. And so that's why I joined. I joined because I was running away from something that I wasn't willing and able to deal with. But then at the same time, you weren't running away from cleaning up your act, right? Right. So you're almost running inward. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And so you were stationed in Germany first, and then you did serve in the Iraq war. Yes. So okay. I'm from Germany, I did an agreement with the Department of the Army and said, hey, if you guys will attend me to canine school, I will go to Korea. They call it a COT, a consecutive overseas tour, which mm -hmm. is pretty rare. Okay. And so with the colonel making the good plug for getting me canine handler, I also worked out that deal to really solidify that deal. And so I went to Korea after Germany. And then after Germany, I was stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado, which is where I deployed out of. Okay. All right. So what kinds of things did you do with these dogs? What were you your know, duties? it was a lot of training. When we were not on missions, stateside that is, it was a lot of training. So a normal day would be picking up a lot of dog poop oh. and the unglorified stuff people don't really realize or think about no. uh, as, as to working dogs. And But what we would do is we would go to like a big warehouse and then we would place either narcotic for a narcotic dog or explosive components for an explosive detection dog. And then we would one by one, meaning each dog team would mm -hmm. go in and search that warehouse and hopefully find the training aids. And that's important because that allows the dog to be rewarded, which you so eloquently pointed out, usually by a ball or a Kong uh -huh. is the motivator. 
And the dog needs that so that they want to keep working, like you mentioned, paycheck. Right. (laughs) So how did that transfer then? I mean, because that was just kind of fun and training, right? I mean, there is still a level of seriousness in that. But then how did that transfer into like real war? I mean, was the dog just on on par? Well, for the most part, yes. And here's what's cool about dogs. They don't necessarily know that we're in Iraq versus Arizona. They're like, oh, it's just hot out, right? Right. They don't really know those, nor do they really care. When we tell them the command to search, they start working. And Mm -hmm. so whether, and they're working not to find the bomb that may blow up. They don't know that. They're just searching for the odor that we train them to respond to, meaning usually sit, Mm -hmm. because they know when they find that odor and they sit, they get to play with their toy. That's all they're doing is they're really just, they're searching so that they can play. Okay. But I would imagine still, with that being said, I mean, they are picking up on your energy and you've got to have more anxious, nervous energy with all that adrenaline running, right? You're so right. So... Um, did that make the dog react a little differently? It did. And, you know, I I talk about this in my second TEDx talk, which is coming next month. And I share on, in this talk how on my very first bomb threat sweep, I was panicked and just out, I'll, I'll give you the line. I was panicked and outright rude to my canine Zito. And as the lights and sirens were wailing through the street on the way to the bomb threat sweep, Zita was barking and I yelled at him to shut up, right? So he felt my panic. Mm -hmm. And so he was barking and and getting worked up with me. And I was honestly scared because I didn't know what to expect. They said there was a bomb in a Walmart. And because I took my job so seriously, I literally thought that there was. And so, yes, everything does run down leash. And so what, however I'm feeling, the dog will often feel as well. Okay. All right. So a lot of these jobs actually did inflict trauma for you. Very common. Absolutely. And then the other part of that is similar to humans where some have more resiliency than others. Mm -hmm. Some are more sensitive than others. Right. And so some dogs get impacted by PTSD and also same with people. Right. Yeah. And so what happens in that situation? Do they get a break? Take a sabbatical? I mean, you're you're at war, so there's really no break. Right. That's a really great question. And so my dog got injured seven months on into our deployment. And so because Zito got hurt, he was, Zito was my German sh- explosive German shepherd that I deployed with. And so because Zito got injured, because we're a dog team, he and I came back together after seven months in the war zone. Mm-hmm. And Zito was deemed undeployable, meaning he had to work stateside. Okay. Now, Zito didn't necessarily have PTSD. However, he got injured, so they didn't want to put him through the strenuous work of combat. Right. Okay. Now, did you know that you were experiencing PTSD at the time? No, I didn't have a clue. In fact, the interesting part for me was when I got back from the war, I was due to get out of the Army two months later, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And they do an evaluation of physical before you get out. And the doctor diagnosed me as general anxiety disorder. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I feel a bit different, but it wasn't, was not until I got out and I started to do the normal civilian things, going out in public and being around crowds and all these kinds of things where I, I don't want to drive over trash in the middle of the road. Mm. I can't step on a sewer manhole cover because I'm thinking it can explode. If I see a mailbox, a big mailbox where you put your letters in, you know, the big receptacles, if I see that, I walk across the street because that thing could blow up. Mm. And so it wasn't until those things that I was like, huh, I wasn't like that before. This is, this is a bit much. And there was many other factors and symptoms as well that I I had gone to the VA and it was like, you know, this, I don't know, things just don't seem right. Uh-huh. And so they evaluated me and they're like, yep, you definitely have PTSD. Oh. And that's how I discovered it. Okay. Well, I hate to interrupt you again, Ryan, but we're going to have to take another break. So everyone stick around for more Love from the Hip.
On this weekly Skinny, I would like to talk about a recent article in the New York Times by Aaron E. Carroll, a professor of pediatrics, on the safety of sunscreen. The FDA conducted a recent study which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, which randomly assigned 24 healthy people to one of four sunscreens. Two of these were sprays, the third was a lotion, and the fourth a cream. The participants were told to apply the sunscreen to 75% of their body four times a day for four days. They then drew 30 blood samples from these participants over the course of a week. The study examined four common sunscreen ingredients, including avobenzone, oxybenzone, octocrylene, and acamsol. All four of them had systemic concentrations which passed the nanogram threshold, which according to FDA rec guidelines, is anything greater than 0.5 nanogram per millimeter of blood. Anything at this systemic absorption is ordered by the FDA to undergo a toxicology assessment to see if it causes birth defects, cancer, and other adverse effects. These four passed this threshold on the first day of the study. The levels were higher for the entire week for all the products except the cream. There was also an accumulation of the chemicals in the body as the days of usage continued. Carol goes on to say, currently there is no evidence of sunscreens actually being harmful and these amounts absorbed may actually be okay. The FDA, unsatisfied with this discovery, is further investigating the absorption and currently preparing a final recommendation. In the meantime, they are advising that sunscreens with para-aminobenzoic acid, which can be linked to allergies, and trolamine salicylate, which can be associated with bleeding, should not be regarded as safe and effective, while sunscreens with zinc and or titanium dioxide should be generally regarded as safe and effective. These compounds, which are inorganic, are not absorbed into the body and instead sit on the surface of your skin, reflecting and absorbing the sun's harmful rays. Of course, though, most people veer away from these because of their ghost-like appearance and instead prefer sunscreens that are fully absorbed. Studies are now finding an accumulation of sunscreen in sea creatures and the ocean as well. According to Carol, in recent years, Hawaii, Key West, and other tropical destinations have started to ban sunscreens with organic ingredients like oxybenzone, octinosate, and parabens because they are accumulating in the living organisms and also damaging the coral reef. And with the tens of thousands of people in the ocean wearing sunscreen, significant doses are building up. In fact, the International Coral Reef Initiative is doing more research on the effect of sunscreen on the reef and its inhabitants. In a recent study, they found that even zinc oxide and titanium dioxide could also have a bleaching effect on the coral. Limiting the amount of sunscreen, wearing UV protective clothing, and just staying in the shade may be the answers to help the environment. Of course, the alternative to not wearing sunscreen at all is potentially getting skin cancer, which is so much worse. Did you know that your skin is your body's first defense against disease and infection? BrioTech knows and has developed their topical skin spray to enhance your skin's natural healing responses and defenses. BrioTech is all about providing its customers products that help promote skin wellness. BrioTech Topical Skin Spray is a light misting spray free of added fragrance, oil, alcohol, and parabens. All this protection without clogging your pores. It's a must addition to your all around daily skincare regimen. Try BrioTech, a collection of sprayers from two ounces to eight ounces. With this bundle, you can have BrioTech Topical Skin Spray wherever life takes you. All natural and safe to use from head to toe. Irritations, redness, post-procedure sensitivities? Get BrioTech Topical Skin Spray today. Years in the making, doctor recommended, and available through Amazon. Learn more at BrioTechUSA.com. That's B-R-I-O-T-E-C-H-U-S-A.com. Support your skin at BrioTechUSA.com. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash 1150KKNW. Welcome back to Love from the Hip. I'm spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and your host, Sakura Sutter. And feel free to email me at sakura at lovefromthehip.com with your comments, your criticisms, your questions, and well wishes. Let me know how I am doing. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Ryan Matthews. He is an Army veteran and former military war dog handler who worked with elite Army canines, a TEDx speaker, author, and dog trainer. 
So, Ryan, if you could briefly tell us the timeline of events that finally made you deal with your PTSD. All right. Absolutely. Happy to share. And I'm a bit of a slow learner and very stubborn. And you all listening are going to get what I mean because I didn't pick up on it right away. And you're probably going to get frustrated as you hear this and thinking, come on, you got to pick up on it. But it was essentially one of the my first traumatic, my first PTSD experience was as a little boy, which I won't get into. Uh, but after the military, of course, I got PTSD from the war. After I got out of the army, I met an incredible woman by the name of Lindsay Davis, who I was in a long distance relationship with. We went on an ATV ride in Utah and I remember seeing 5'2", 52 miles per hour and I drove the ATV over the mountain cliff oh. and the ATV crushed her and I rolled down the mountain and the helmet busted open on a boulder, my helmet, and I woke up choking up water in a stream oh. and I got PTSD and didn't want anything to do with vehicles or motorbikes or anything like that for quite a while. And so that was one. Now I'm happy to say that Lindsay did survive that accident. Right. And um, sadly, three years, this was in 2009, three years ago, um, she did get back on an ATV and she did transition. Ah, wow. Uh, but she was an incredible soul and I really enjoyed all my time with her. So I just wanted to send some love to her. Yeah. But, so that was one really traumatic event. And the other interesting part is that PTSD can show up in different ways. Mm -hmm. And now when I got out of the army, I moved to Colorado to take care of Lindsay after that accident and nurse her back to her health. And so I opened up a pet dog training company and I ended up turning a $12,000 investment into the franchise into close to a million dollars in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And that sounds great. And people always, oh, wow, wow. But what you don't know was that I was addicted to my work because I was trying to silence the voice of PTSD in my head. Mm. So I became a workaholic and I ended up getting stage three colon cancer at the age of 30. That was eight years ago. Wow. And that was traumatic. Like yeah. I just had stomach pain. I didn't know what the heck it was. And the way I found out was really horrible. The nurse came in and said, how are you going to deal with the fact that you may die of cancer? Oh my gosh. And I screamed at her like, get the, you know what, out of my room. And that's how I discovered. So that even made it more traumatic. Right. And I have learned to create a visualization technique to rid any negative thoughts or emotions as it relates to me getting cancer again. So that was May of 2011 was a stage three cancer diagnosis. And just two months later on the 4th of July, a day that is really difficult for combat vets, mm -hmm. so much so. I used to go and hide in the mountains of Colorado where there was no fireworks. I no longer do that, but that's what I once had done. Um, the 4th of July of 2011, I ended up having a Widowmaker heart attack. Huh. And a Widowmaker obviously is called that because you're not supposed to survive it. It, text, it attacks the left ventricle or the left anterior or something like that. Okay. And so that was really difficult as well. And so I had PTSD. I remember talking to my ex-wife every night and I would look to her and say, am I going to wake up tomorrow? Like I had no confidence right. as it relates to my physical well-being or my even emotional well-being as well. Yeah. And so it was like this thing after this thing after this thing. And the other piece was that a month after that cancer, the heart attack, should I say, I went back to work and I wanted my drug of work again. And that's when I made the worst mistake of my life because my dog had a little sore on her paw and I put a muzzle on her, but she ended up charging me when I put the muzzle on her. And this is a Belgian Malinois, like you mentioned earlier about the breeds of working dogs. Mm -hmm. so this is a lot of dogs. She's intense, but she didn't want to hurt me. She just wanted to say, get this dang muzzle off. But when she did that, I went into a PTSD rage and mm -hmm. I tossed her and I struck her with two, two closed fists. And my office manager turned me in for animal cruelty and I hired an attorney. She watched the video and she said, you'll never go to jail for this. Don't worry. But 24 hours later, the media got a hold of the story and I was on the front page of the newspaper and I was on the news and this thing was nationwide. Mm. I did lose the business. I lost my dogs and I went to jail and I hid for five years. Wow. Five years. 
and I wanted to kill myself because of the shame and this guilt. And the dog sustained no injuries, but I still took on all that guilt. Right. Well, three years ago, that was again in 2011. And three years ago, I thought I was having another heart attack and I felt very weak and my head was about to hit the ground and just pass out. And I thought I was passing out to die. Well, eventually I had this wisdom come over me, like from a, from another source that shook me up and was like, get your life back. And in this moment, I realized that I had wasted my last five years and didn't do anything with my life. And here I am about to die. And I had so much regret. Well, I promised that I would transform my life in that moment. And I promised that I would share how I did it with other people. And so that was my life-changing crucible moment was that second, what I thought was a heart attack, where I truly vowed to change who I am and move past my trauma. Hmm. So when you vowed that, what actually physically happened in that moment? I felt very weak and it felt like very blackness come over me where like it was hard to see it was hard to talk I called 911 I could barely talk and I was like I've had a heart attack before I think I'm having another one come please and like my head just my body everything just wanted to lay down on the floor and like give up on us it was so weird Mm -hmm. and so I thought it was a heart attack because I had had one before and the first heart attack I just started sweating profusely at random right and so that's this happened again this time and so I thought I was having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the ambulance came and they did an EKG and they said, we can see that you've had a heart attack. We don't know if you had, uh, but we need to take you to the ER. And the doctors don't know what happened. Mm. They don't. And, but nonetheless, it shook me up enough finally for me to make that change. And that's for me what really matters. Right. Absolutely. That's an incredible story. <laughs> <laughs> and we all have our faults, so no judgment right? So what kind of work did you end up doing to help yourself heal and overcome PTSD? My friends that know me say I go 150 at whatever I do, and that's what I did with this healing. So I had done shamans, talk therapy, acupuncture, float therapy, numerous retreats on PTSD, read multiple books. I've done EMDR, EFT, emotional freedom technique, the emotional freedom technique, which is like a tapping. Mm -hmm. So I've done just, I've done hypnosis once. And I I do want to talk to you about that one day uh, because I'm interested in in hiring you for that. (laughs) So I've done just about everything that's out there. Yeah. And even music therapy, where Mm -hmm. we took my story and we turned it into a song. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I did that with Big Machine Records. And which is the largest country label in the world, actually. Huh. And I was just, you know, very open-minded. Right. Various modalities. And some of them felt good and some didn't. Yeah. What were you starting to notice when you were doing these modalities in yourself? Mm. Starting to slow down. Mm. Starting to have more patience with myself. Starting to have more patience with people. Because people are a trigger for a lot of... Uh, that outside people, you know, the public is, is a trigger for a lot of folks with PTSD. Right. And I just seem to be calmer. And I do want to share that meditation was one of the five things that really has transformed my life. Mm. And so once that practice started to come into play, that was an absolute game changer. Right. And I would think that that would work immensely because combat teaches you to be in the present moment. Well, meditation does the same thing. So now you're just rewiring your brain, right? Absolutely. In a calmer sense. Well, that's great that you dove right in. So was more opportunity also coming your way once you were starting to deal with your PTSD? Wow. It's been incredible. And <laughs> look, I want to, I'm going to share some things because I want to share it as motivation for others that may be going through some things. And guys, look. I hid for five years. I wanted to kill myself. And it wasn't easy to do the work. One of my healers calls it going into the swamp lands of the soul. And it's truth. Mm. Right. Mm. But on the other side, what I'm doing, like you're part of my journey right now in this moment, as I'm able to share and be received from you all, which means so much, you're helping heal me. Mm -hmm. And so the more I've shared 
on these on the radio on the tv the more it's just now being i'm just being a vehicle of a message and information to share with other people to help up level and uplift them right right there's a reason why you went through everything that you did that's right. But my first few podcasts or radio interviews, I was crying during the stuff that I had shared moments ago. And it gets a bit easier the more we do it. So I just encourage people to lean in. Mm-hmm. There's definitely healing and vulnerability. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it was hard. I was raised to be this machismo, this tough guy, right, yeah. as a teenager. And then even also as the military. And so I had to also look to myself on who am I authentically. And one thing I've learned is people think vulnerability is just beautiful. They are like, you're like a magnet. People want to come to you when you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of public speaking. And when I'm vulnerable and I go into that swamp lands of the soul, it's crazy how people come up and just share how they can relate. Mm -hmm. And we are, this beautiful connection is taking place. Yeah. It's definitely magical. Well, hey, Ryan, I hate to interrupt you again, but we're going to have to take another break. So everyone stick around for more Love from the Hip. Peach fuzz is great if it's on a peach. Let Sakura Skin and Mind remove unsightly hair with dermaplaning. Although its primary purpose is to remove layers of dead skin, it's just one of the added benefits, leaving your skin baby smooth, safe, effective, fast, and affordable. What a concept. Sakura Skin and Mind wants you to look your very best, and dermaplaning is just one tool in their chest. Find out about dermaplaning at sakuraskinandmind.com. S-A-K-U-R-A, skinandmind.com. We bring out the healthy skin and healthy way of thinking you didn't know you had. Post-traumatic stress syndrome affects people from all walks of life. Triggered by sexual assault, traffic, collisions, warfare, or other threats to life. PTSD is a killer. Every day, an average of 22 veterans commit suicide due in part to PTSD. Retired U.S. Colonel Debbie Simpson struggled with her own PTSD following a military career specializing in critical care. Debbie turned to dancing as a way to heal unresolved grief, guilt, and shame caused by the losses of war. The benefits were so great that she founded the nonprofit Battlefield to Ballroom, a unique approach to assisting other brave warriors. Battlefield to Ballroom has partnered with famed dance company Arthur Murray International to help veterans in need. If you or someone you know can benefit, Log on now to battlefieldtoballroom.org. That's battlefield, the number two, ballroom.org. Life is a dance, and you can give the gift of the first steps towards recovery. Donate at battlefieldtoballroom.org today. Did you know that your skin is your body's first defense against disease and infection? BrioTech knows and has developed their topical skin spray to enhance your skin's natural healing responses and defenses. BrioTech is all about providing its customers products that help promote skin wellness. BrioTech Topical Skin Spray is a light misting spray, free of added fragrance, oil, alcohol, and parabens. All this protection without clogging your pores. It's a must addition to your all around daily skincare regimen. Try BrioTech, a collection of sprayers from two ounces to eight ounces. With this bundle, you can have BrioTech Topical Skin Spray wherever life takes you. All natural and safe to use from head to toe. Irritations, redness, post-procedure sensitivities? Get BrioTech Topical Skin Spray today. Years in the making, doctor recommended, and available through Amazon. Learn more at BrioTechUSA.com. That's B-R-I-O-T-E-C-H-U-S-A.com. Support your skin at BrioTechUSA.com. Want a more youthful figure no matter what age? Find answers at Madsen Medical Spa. Allow doctors Aaron and Paul to help you eliminate your frustration with weight management. Say no, no to yo-yo, diets, and exhausting exercise grinds. Madsen Medical Spa will do the heavy lifting for you and coach you all the way through to your ideal weight. We offer the latest and greatest in body sculpting and body contouring lasers and devices, high quality nutritional supplements and meal replacements, as well as mindful practices. We will treat the inside to treat the outside, and it's all personal 
personally tailored for you. Men and women, drop inches, not just pounds, and see a healthy, beautiful you. Consultations are free. Results are priceless. Log on to MadsenMedSpa.com. That's M-A-D-S-E-N MedSpa.com. Or call 425-656-8008. That's 425-656-8008. Get the shape you want this summer. Become a healthier, more beautiful you. Giving local voices a chance to shine. Alternative Talk, 1150. Welcome back to Love from the Hip. I'm spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and your host, Sakura Sutter. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast on Podcast One, Love from the Hip, and that's HYP. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Ryan Matthews. He is an Army veteran, former military war dog handler who worked with elite Army canines, a TEDx speaker, author, and dog trainer. So, Ryan, really briefly, can you tell us how dog training helps one to overcome PTSD? It, absolutely. It took me a while to really hone in on that, and it keeps resurfacing. People have been asking me that a lot lately. And so what I decided to do was share that by way of the TEDx stage. And so on August 18th, I'll be sharing the life lessons that dogs teach us. Mm. What I will be talking about is three main points. And one is dogs teach us how to be enthusiastic, right? And so a lot of times when we have trauma or PTSD, we're very monotone and very held back. But when we start to come out of our shell and be enthusiastic, when we see people and kind of like use dog as your role model, how they're so happy and cheerful and be enthusiastic to kind of make others feel really important, right? And so in making other people feel important, you're going to start to feel better and important yourself is one. The other piece is unconditional love, which dogs have shown me time and time again. And so if we, as those with PTSD, can remember unconditional love, because there's going to be all these triggers and we're going to want to put up walls as it relates to our feelings and our emotions and and be numb, but it's really about leaning in and loving unconditionally it's really going to be a game changer to move past trauma. Again, those little voice is going to mess with you, but leaning in with that unconditional love. Uh, and then the other part is that dogs teach us is they don't take things personal. In the instance of when they fight, they get over it quickly. They get over drama. And the same thing holds true with us, with PTSD and trauma, is we're going to have drama every now and then. We're going to get triggered and we're going to act dumb maybe and have some regret. At least that's been my truth. Yeah. But if we don't take things so personal and we're not always thinking everyone is out to get us, I feel like we can let our shoulders drop and and let our guard down a bit more. And when we do screw up, again, don't take it so serious and don't take things so personal when we feel like people are potentially attacking us or saying stuff about us. Because again, dogs are so in the moment and they're not taking things personally. Mm -hmm. And so the three things would be, again, and be enthusiastic love unconditionally, and to not take things personally. Okay, that's excellent. Well, what's, what's one takeaway for, for today from your personal transformation that you can share with my listeners? Sure, it's really, this is going to maybe be the comfortable thing that people may want to hear, but it's the only way through it is through it. Mm. If we want to overcome something, we can't avoid it. We got to face it and we got to lean in and do the work. And I promise you, if you really lean in and do the work, you will get, you will feel much better. Okay. And can I ask you with everything that has happened to you and your whole incredible journey, but with cancer and the widow maker and everything else, would you do it all over again? Wow. I would say yes, because I would never be where I am now without all of that. Right. Okay. And then I also want to ask you, you still have current triggers for PTSD, right? Absolutely. But what I do is I don't want to put my back to the front door at a restaurant, but I do it. Or I don't want to step on the sewer manhole cover, but I do it. And so I I just don't let them have any power over me. And then I breathe through them and I lie to myself because the brain doesn't know the difference between a truth and a lie. So I tell myself, I'm so happy right now. (laughs) Okay. So you're just pushing through it. That's right. Okay. So how can my listeners contact you or learn more about you? Sure. On social media, they can find me at I am Ryan Matthews. 
Yes. That's two T's and an S at the end. Okay. And you also said you have another TEDx talk coming up? Yeah. People could Google Ryan Matthews TEDx speaker. And the next TEDx talk is going to be in Sky Forest, which is Lake Arrowhead, California area. And it's August 18th. And they could go to TEDxSkyForest.com for that. And if people wanted to talk about public speaking, they could find me at imryanmatthews.com. Okay, great. And then also your book too, right? Yeah, the book is on Amazon. It's called The Canine Connection. And I am in the process of getting a book deal on my second book where we talk more about the life lessons that dogs teach us and overcoming trauma through dog training techniques, actually. Wow. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks again for being here today and being vulnerable and sharing your story. I enjoyed it and I appreciate this opportunity and I hope that we were able to bring a lot of value and things that will help your audience. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks again to Eric, my amazing producer, and you, the listener. You can find me at lovefromthehip.com or sakuraskinandmind.com. You can also follow me on Instagram or on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel as well as my podcast on Podcast One, Love from the Hip, and that's HYP. And if you really love the show and are interested in running an ad for your own business or you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me at sakura at lovefromthehip.com. And tune in next Wednesday at 2 p.m. for another Love from the Hip and make self-love contagious. Go ahead, I dare ya. Peach fuzz is great. If it's on a peach, let Sakura Skin and Mind remove unsightly hair with dermaplaning. Although its primary purpose is to remove layers of dead skin, it's just one of the added benefits, leaving your skin baby smooth, safe, effective, fast, and affordable. What a concept! Sakura Skin and Mind wants you to look your very best, and dermaplaning is just one tool in their chest. Find out about dermaplaning at sakuraskinandmind.com. S-A-K-U-R-A, skinandmind.com. We bring out the healthy skin and healthy way of thinking you didn't know you had.